Hi, my dear friends. Uh, today is another beautiful day with another a great musician. The ubasana of music, the worship of the music, mainly in Indian classical music. It is not belongs to any border. It not belongs to the culture. It is belongs to the way of thinking. It belongs to how you are, what you are. Within one day, you can't become musician. It is continuous process of practicing and sadhana. Today we have a specific guest from US, but she never identify herself. She is she is from America because. Her most of the life was in India. She has gone through the Indian music, identify Indian culture. She traveled all over India. This is amusing. Doctor Amy Mazinskovsky, an American sitar player, product of Shanti Niketan, Kolkata. Dr. Ami is an internationally acclaimed sitarist, teaching artist, and ethnomusicologist who has spent her adult life studying, performing, teaching, and promoting the music of South Asia. Her training includes a decades study in India, both academic Bachelor of Music, gold medalist, Master of Music Merit Scholar at Shanti Nigedan, West Bengal. An immersion of apprenticeship under the late Pandit Suresh Mishra and PhD, University of Texas, Austin, and postdoctoral fellowship, University of uh, Alberta, Canada, in Athenaeum Musicology, and mem. Mem mentorship with the Grammy nominated Sarod Mastro Ashish Khan and the late Hindustani vocal Diva Patma Bhushan, Patma Vibhushan Giridya Deviji. Ami has performed concert and taught in resident residencies, workshop, and several university faculties throughout North America, India, Pakistan. Europe and Japan. She has been juried artist on a Texas Art Commission touring roster mid America Arts Alliance, a panel artist of India World Cultural Forum, and multiple grand awardee from the City of Dallas Office of uh, Arts and Culture and City of Austin Cultural Artist Division. She served as visiting musician researcher at ITC Sankhid Research Academy, Kolkata, and New Mexico Arts Division Artist in Residence. She toured in 2013 to 14 with Oscar winning screenwriter Jean Claude, career and soundtrack composer and performer for Inact Artist Arts production of Kari Mahabharata. She was awarded the Gandharva Puraskar in 2014 by Hindustan Art and Music Society for her contribution to Indian music abroad. In 2016, upon invitation from the US Consulate Lahore, Pakistan, she completed a cultural diplomacy performance and outreach tour during which the Lahore Mozang Rotary Club felicitated her for using music as a tool for peace across borders in 2018 with the team supported by grant from the American Institute of Pakistan Studies. She conducted faculty training workshop for Pakistan's Higher Education Commission in Punjab and Khyber Pakova and Siddharth performance music instruction at National Academy for Performing Arts 
NAPA, Karachi. Her 2019 South Asia tour include performance and uh, workshop at Fatima Jinnah Women's University, Rawalpindi, Pakistan, Ashish Khan School of World Music, Kolkata, and Sandikada Institute, Lucknow. Passionate about women's human rights, she was published numerous. She has published numerous books, scholarly art, and produced, directed three noted ethnographic films on socially marginalized musicians. It's too much. A lot of things to talk about her. I'm not talking too much. You are going to listen to her. You are going to enjoy their music. You are going to. She is going to share with you her musical experience with India and myself. I can proudly say I have got several concerts with her in U.S. She was my my host whenever I go there U.S. and she was most senior in Shanti Niketan. I'm proud to say she has given her all life to learn Indian classical music. My dear friends, here I am welcoming my Didi, a great musician. <laughs> I can't say what is it actually. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yes. No, no, I'm unmuted. I was muted. Now I'm unmuted. Okay. Okay, Amidi, uh, welcome to my show. It is a wonderful to you are here with, with us. And there are a lot of people are uh, uh, there in online, uh, in Facebook. Uh, they are for a lot of my followers. Last, last two, three, one month continuously every day, I'm spending with several maestros, several musicians from Carnatic, Indian, Western. Uh, and all of the world actually you are today with us a uh, wonderful musician wonderful human being a lady with strings that's great yeah, thank <laughs> you so much <clears throat> Polly, you're I'm, so kind what a kind introduction and i'm sorry it was kind of a mouthful of stuff um so uh yes um namaskar friends and um Polly, thank you very much uh, my brother for having me here on this wonderful show. I'm very excited to be part of it and to connect with so many um, music lovers and arts lovers around the world, around India, um, around South Asia. So um... I, I, just, I just want to uh, ask some questions to you before Absolutely. we go for a play together. Um, yeah. Uh, my dear friends, we will play together. You can listen. Uh, com coming uh, second uh, minutes are actually for you. We will play together. Anyway, we are going some questions to her. Some, uh, what was your experience with Indian music at Shanti Niketan? It was life changing. Um, when I was there, <clears throat> uh, late seventies until mid eighties, uh, it was before it was pre globalized India. So um, when you were there, you were there only. Uh, there was very little contact with outside world. Um, I keep telling people now that, uh, you know, social media uh, immersed people that uh, that time you would um, send an aerogram to communicate. So I, you know, my parents and I wrote letters once a month to each other. Um, if you needed to make a phone call, you know, you have to go, maybe there were a few phones in the whole town. Uh, you have to book a call and um, even to Kolkata. So, I mean, international call was a big deal. You have to plan hours in advance. Sometimes it's overnight before you can get the line. Um, and it was just a beautiful environment um, because as many of you know, it's, um, it's a, international university and this international community set in a rural setting and um, it's changed and grown a lot now but still there has been this international connection since the end of the 19th century 
So over a hundred years. So it's very universal. That's why Vishwa Bharati, you know, is the universe of of Bharat of India. And um, the at that time there were so many um, maestros and scholars there. You know, we always say um, that things were better back then. I don't know if they were, but my experience was just amazing. Um, and also we got to so there were such distinguished. Um, people on the faculty and uh, the gurus and um, also the great, great legendary musicians would come and perform and we could um, interact with them closely, like Nikhil Banerjee, late Pandit Nikhil Banerjee. He came for six months. Um, soon after, he, he had a heart attack in the late 70s and he came to recuperate. So we would go to his house and, you know, hang out, listen to him practice. He was very nice and he had a big bungalow with his wife and daughter. And in Shanti Nikitan, um, everybody's doors were open to everybody else, especially the teachers um, always welcomed students and well-wishers. So it was this constant person-to-person um, -person interaction in a very casual way. And um, <clears throat> the other thing that um, I didn't realize it at that time, but uh, because I was just learning about the culture of India, but um, the, every, it was quite an egalitarian place. Um, so everybody, you know, the elders are all Dada and Didi. And um, so who's Ustad and who's not, it wasn't really a big deal. You know, just um, the, the respect really was about age, you know, and... Uh, so, but they're the elder brother, or maybe they're the aunt, if they're your uh, friend's parents. So, um, even though there was a lot of respect for age and accomplishment and merit, um, it was in a, in a pretty egalitarian setting. Um, and also, uh, the interaction with the villagers, the Adivasis, the Santals, was very beautiful. Um, in fact, I still... I, I built a little um, uh, cottage in the village, Lalband, uh, just on the edge of Shanti Nikitan that belongs, it's on land that belongs to a Santal family. And I've seen, I still am in touch with them. Um, I've seen their kids born and now they've grown up. So it's just a really, it was this um, very uh, multi-layered um, atmosphere and um, just a lot of care and love from all kinds of people. Um, there were politics, not that there weren't any. Um, it had in some ways a small town mentality. People often knew what everybody else is doing. Um, the music making was rather casual. I think as far as professionalism, probably staying in Kolkata would have um, been a little bit better to polish professionalism for me. Um, but I think for basic training to start from zero, um, it was just an um, ideal place. Um, plus the nature, I'm a nature lover. I grew up in a rural area. So <clears throat> that um, rural environment where you, you go to class and you sometimes sit outside and then you go out to the villages on bicycles, um, that was really the entertainment. Um, and these wonderful concerts would happen that were in the moonlight or whatever, or someone's house. Um, so it was just, uh, it's just a unique uh, decade of my life that I'm very grateful to. Who was your first? Who was your first sitar teacher uh, from Shanti Niketan? My first sitar teacher was late Pandit Suresh Misra, who was on the faculty there. And yeah. the story, how did I meet him? Um, it was when I was, I traveled overland to India through um, North Africa, Southern Europe, and then um, Turkey, Iran, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Could and you tilt down with way, your camera? Could you tilt down I, your camera? Just? Oh, tilt down okay. Your camera. Like this? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Yes, fine. Okay, yeah. Um, so on the way, I met someone. I met a Bengali gentleman 
uh, from Kolkata, and I was saying, at uh, that time I thought I would dabble in learning <laughs> Indian music, right? Dabble in learning sitar. We didn't know anything back then. You know, we had heard of sitar through the Beatles who introduced Ravi Shankar. That was it. You know, this is pre uh, globalization, no internet, um, no no media. I mean, very limited media compared to now. Um, and anyway, so this gentleman said, if you want to learn Indian music, Shanti Nikitan is a good place. I didn't want to go where all the hippies went to Banaras or Goa or something. I wanted to. I'm always kind of. I like to be on my own path. And so he said, well, I have a classmate who is a musician and a t teacher there, and that happened to be the late Pandit Ranadir Rai, who was an Esraj exponent. Um, and so by the time I got to Kolkata, I got his contact information. And um, contact information means they live in a certain part of town back then. So I arrived and, uh, in Bolpur and I told the rickshawala that I want to go to, that time I knew, Tukuda. Tukuda was his nickname. I, uh, please take me there. In very, I just knew very, very basic Hindi back then. Um, and uh, so they took me there and he was very nice. And he said, um, first you have to go. So we have a um, teacher here on the faculty, um, Bandit Suresh Mishra. Um, but first you need to go to his senior students and she will be able to determine whether you know you can learn from him or not. So I did, and that happened to be um, Kajul Chatterjee, who is an eminent sitarist, very senior sitarist in Kolkata. And um, that time I went with my cheap sitar. Oh, I, what I forgot to say was in, um, in my travels in India, before I got to Shantinikatan, um, I had to buy a sitar, right? So I went to Banaras, that's where people said you go back then. And in this um, touristy shop, um, there was, uh, you know, the mystery, the craftsman, um, who the people that fix the sitars, not even make the sitars. So he was doing the jawari. Jawari is the bridge. Um, and as he was doing, as they do that, as they do the jawari, they play to check the sound. And that's really, that's the first time I heard it live. And in Hindi, I would say, Much pe jadu dala. It was just like, it cast a spell on me. Just the sound of this person, um, you know, working on the instrument and just playing a little bit. That was it, you know, and I have not looked back. So anyway, I had this cheap sitar from this um, tourist shop in Banaras. So I went to Kajuldi and um, she showed me very basic things and she taught me one gut in Yemen and then when she saw I could pick it up um, because I had some uh, Western music training from my childhood, not very much, but I had an ear. And um, she said, I'll take you to Misraji. So that's how um, it started. And then Misraji said, you know, you foreigners, you don't have time to learn. This music takes a long time. And I said, you know, I'll stay. You know, <laughs> I, I don't have any plans to leave. I have a visa for six months. And um, he said, six months is not enough. But anyway, you know, we started and then um, uh, I enrolled in the university to get the uh, long term visas, actually. Um, but uh, so it was it was amazing. It was life changing. There were obstacles um, at that time. There was this idea that foreigners uh, can't really learn um, Shastriya Sangeet. Um, so there were two things. So in order to learn, someone would say, in order to learn our music, you need to learn to sing first. But you're a foreigner, so you can't sing our music. And then the other thing is um, you have to learn a second subject in the university. Um, so, well, there weren't many offerings. I didn't really want to do dance because it would be distracting from the instrument. And I'm not really a dancer. Um, uh, so you could take esraj or tabla, basically. Those were, yeah, I think those were the only instruments offered other than sitar. And um, so they said, you're a girl, so you can't learn tabla. So I learned esraj. Uh, so there were often, there were a lot of, um, what can I say, social um, obstacles, societal obstacles at that time that 
have have become less now. You know, like a lot of foreigners, a whole generation of non-Indians has become have become quite accomplished in um, Shastri Sangeet, both Hindustani and Karnatic. And um, more and more women instrumentalists are on the scene, are, you know, playing very well. Uh, again, there's a difference for those who are uh, not aware that in Carnatic music, there are there's always been women instrumentalists. Women have always played vina, right, and violin, um, and even murdangam to some extent. But in Hindustani music, really, until well, the first generation of women instrumentalists. Um, there were very few women instrumentalists until the 60s. I mean, there were a few, but very few. In fact, that was part of my um, PhD research was about gender in Hindustani music. There were a very few in the 40s um, in Kolkata. And then there's a generation of elder women, many of whom are gone now, actually. But one is still living, a sitar's name, Jaya Biswas, um, in Kolkata. Uh, there was a woman named um, Kalyani Rai, and uh, of course Annapurna Devi, um, my guru aunt. Um, she's uh, she was um, Ustad Ali Akbar Khan Sab's sister, and she was you know really the legend. And then a few Sarod players, um, uh, Sharan Rani Bhaktival in Delhi, who passed away uh, th maybe three years ago, three four years ago, and. Um, Zarin Daruala in um, Mumbai. But there were very few. And now there's a whole generation, you know, after that of um, very accomplished women instrumentalists. And now as the younger generation, women in their 20s and 30s, there's more and more. And tabla players as well. So That is a beautiful... Uh, you have, Hearing you such, about such a mastro's something actually you've gone through the very feminist way of uh, <laughs> what a kind of uh, uh, instrumentalist over there actually normally uh -huh. indian musicians never uh, i mean male no musicians or critics never bother about actually who are the female musicians all over there actually because india's male oriented <laughs> culture is yeah there. yeah it's <laughs> very patriarchal and um, uh, we see it you know in however in um Let's see. There have been a few conferences of women in Hindustani music long ago. See, I did this all. So there were um, in, I think in the 80s, I, I'm not remembering that well, um, a, a vocalist from Delhi named Shanno Kurana, Dr. Shanno Kurana, um, had uh, put on a conference of women musicians where there were some, of course, there, were, there have always been vocalists, uh, but there were some, at that time, the instrumentalists and even um, uh, percussionists were <clears throat> invited to perform. Uh, it was a festival held in Delhi. Um, I think she did it three years in a row. Um, so that was one. And then there's another thing about women. I mean, now people are discussing it and writing about it, but I started, I was one of the early researchers about the um, hereditary professional women, marginalized women. So you call them Tawaif in North India and Devadasi in South. And then other names, but those are the most common um, social groups, I guess, communities. Um, so now people are talking about, and there have been over the years, Bollywood, you know, you had Umrao Jan, the first Umrao Jan film, you had Mughle Azan, and now there's, you know, quite a bit of research, but I, I kind of did some re earlier research from the 90s until about 2012 um, <clears throat> on that. But the women instrumentalists, um, I don't think there is much... Uh, scholarly research or even <laughs> journalistic today also today so there are some women uh, musicians are there but they couldn't uh, prolong their career that because of uh, patriarchal system still uh, capturing them to controlling them 
uh, yeah. because uh, after marriage children yeah. and yeah. all those and family systems right that i mean that, i think that's changing but it's there a lot um <clears throat> but on the other hand there are lots of you know very uh, there have been very legendary uh female vocalists so there's something about and i i've always always been curious about that and I still don't quite have an answer, but there are some very practical answers. You know, that was a question I had. Why are there um, why are there so few instrumentalists? And um, but there are instrumental. I noted in Shanti Nikitan, <clears throat> you know, in my um, sitar class, in my academic classes, there were women. So there, so women studied in certain parts of the country in Bengal, because Bengal is, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in instrumental music. But, uh, and I think in Punjab, too. So there were, um, there were girls studying sitar and israj, but they wouldn't, but it was kind of like a marriage qualification. It wasn't, they wouldn't go beyond that, you know, so it was just kind of a nice thing to know, like embroidery or something. Um, but, but Spend it, but but vocalists, you know, more often went on to have careers, and um, I think I, I I would ask the instrumentalists that I interviewed, in, including um, Anna Purna Devi, who didn't uh, she didn't agree to face to face interview, but we wrote letters, and um, they all said um, that it's. Uh, because if you're a vocalist, there are certain things you can do. You can vocalize. You can do a certain kind of riaz while gumte firte as as you're moving around the house doing Gai housework gi. and stuff. Gaigi style. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, an instrument, you have to sit down and leave everything in practice. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a more technical um, thing. So and and even um, and so. That's what the the answer was, and even Sharan Rani Bakliwal, Sarod player, um, Vidushi, um, said something very interesting in her own personal uh, story. Was that she kept having? She only had one one child, one daughter, who she had at the age of forty, which in India for someone her age, she died three four years ago, and she was probably in her late eighties. You know, she was close, about Apaji Girja Deviji's age. Um, so at that time, to have a ch first child at the age of 40 is almost unthinkable. But she said she kept having miscarriages because uh, she thinks, and also if you're, say, you know, 50 years ago, the health care, um, the prenatal care was still, you know, not that great. But um, it was, she, she thinks holding the sarod close to her might have um, contributed something to the miscarriage. Or maybe just the stress of um, being a touring performer. I'm not sure. But um, anyway, it's, it's um, you know, there are social constraints, but I think, but it's changing a lot now. You know, I see it's, um, you know, my, the generation after me, um, the, people have very different attitudes about it. And Whenever we talk about women musicians, actually, we couldn't forget the legendary singer Girija Devi. You have also gone through the under uh, yeah, of, yeah, uh, yeah. Of course. Could you uh, share some experience with her? Oh, also, she was what she was like my mother. You know, um, I would certain things I could share with her that I couldn't share with my biological mother. I mean, she was such a wise person um, and so elevated her consciousness you know but she was so down to earth she was really um very fun you know and um uh very she well subkili piarta you know she had room for everybody who respected her you know um was welcome was welcome like her like her child or her brother or her sister and um <clears throat> and still her daughter and i are very close muni didi um, yeah. And uh, I stayed with her last winter when I was in Kolkata in December. I stayed with Muni Didi, and um, ha, what can I say? It was well. First of all, it was very special for me because um, it was um, 
the women were the majority in in the household in the classes everything so for the first time um which this is also what um motivated my phd to um to find out what is you know the sort of the women's society of music making as opposed to men's because as an instrumentalist at the time that when i was learning it was um i found myself to be hanging out with men most of the time which um well, you only get part of the story. So uh, being with her was like, it's music is going on. It's just part of everyday living, you know, and um, you have to also cook or do whatever, go shopping, but, and then you, you have to practice and it's all, it's all part of the same fabric of That's, living. In, in fact, yeah. you've gone through the music or vocal or uh, instrumental training. I uh, modern training you have gone through a lot of uh, Indian places actually then you shoot the video films actually yeah. what was the uh, you know, it was amusing you documented a lot of things it is it, it's we, we, we Indians should learn properly to document their own the possible places actually but uh, is uh, as an American musician American uh, 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 enthusiasts to on Indian music uh, Indian art forms Indian culture documented all of, uh, whatever you experienced uh, i came to know that you visited uh, sonagachi once actually to shot something uh, is it what was the experience over well there? no actually um i've been to sonagachi but i i worked in bol bazar because bol bazar. sonagachi is a red light area where the women there the uh, sex workers they are not musicians or dancers they're pure sex workers so but yeah. Bobazar um, uh, has an area, and Bobazar is this historic place in Kolkata, which was kind of an entertainment district. Um, oh. Entertain meaning there was um, there were baijis, they call them as well, um, and living in these buildings, usually above um, jewelers. Their landlord, usually the people that owned the buildings, were and you still have a lot. You know, there are a lot of jewelry shops and. Uh, furniture shops there and above them were the uh, Baiji quarters and even when I started researching I mean it was it was very active until the 80s and I started in the 90s and so it was kind of dying out but there was still um, one building in particular um, where I went to um, where um, uh, Pandit Ramesh Mishra's um, father used to teach so that was kind of the entree that I got, Pandit Ramesh Misra, the Sarangi, late uh, Sarangi maestro, um, who was very, I'm, was always very grateful to him. He took me there and introduced me because he knew um, the, the women who were classical um, singers and dancers because his father used to teach them. Um, so, uh, so that was, it's on, on Bobazar Street. And um, it's, it's not uh, a red light area per se, but everybody knows that in that building there are Baijis. And now um, the classically trained ones have moved out. They, I mean, they became rather old because they were already, um, you know, they're probably like uh, in the late 70s now. And um, the younger ones are not really trained, uh, you know, they, a little bit maybe, but they do film songs uh, more in pop music. And I don't, I haven't been there for several years because the ones that I knew had moved out. Um, so that did was. You uh, did, did you, do you have a publication on uh, uh, Indian? Uh, uh, your experience traveling actually. Was any any. Uh, I don't have sort of a traveling experience one, but I have in my articles, I have some scholarly articles in journals. But so there's one style of ethnographic writing, which is, yeah. you know, it talks, it kind of paints the picture of your surroundings with words. So um, in those, I try to um, describe what it's what it was like. So Bobazar, and then another place where I would go regularly is Musa, Muzaffarpur Bihar. And there is, uh, still, it's not quite like Sonagachi because, Son you know, you think Kolkata is a metro, big metro, right? And it's very crowded. And so the buildings are different. Um, and Muzaffarpur is a big, it's a city, 
but it's um it's uh what can i say it's like a secondary urban center you know it's not a big metro um and uh there's more space i mean it's crowded still north india is crowded but uh the buildings are um not so high and a lot of them are single story so you'll have these little bungalow kind of um places where people live and in in that quarter which i i have um documented extensively um another thing that you see is you'll see jewelers jeweler shops it starts yeah and then yeah. you will often see secular kavals you know the kavali singers who are not necessarily a lineage you know they're not khandani uh which, which means they're not hereditary but they're kind of um they and the subject matter they don't sing uh it's not that religious it's more about social problems and um they'll sing at weddings and stuff like that and they're lower status kaval you know, again you have a whole hierarchy and then you have the baijis and also the closer to the center um the someone lives the higher their status is and the more on the periphery they are the lower their status is so <clears throat> that's what um and i have you know in my films there is footage from from there also i have footage from kolkata from bobazar yeah, yeah. um and a lot of photographs and stuff so this is amazing actually anyway it's a wonderful experience we my viewers are listening now uh, and uh, nothing to say i yeah i also went to um uh allahabad um and i was kind of the edge of uh but of a uh area like quarter like that but they wouldn't allow me to meet who i wanted to meet but i also went to jonpur has um also a baiji pada jonpur in yeah. up yeah so yeah. i went there too and interviewed some women um an, another an interesting thing about the uh baijis and thawaifs and i don't know what happens in the south but in the north um sometimes not always sometimes when they reach a certain age they change when they're not no longer sexually attractive whatever they become kavalas they so it means they sing they lead parties of men um yeah. and they are the lead sing, they sing kavali um, oh <laughs> yeah so um that's uh, you know that's like a, it's a positive career change for an older woman who has been in that profession you know so um and there it's also you know it's interesting because when they are um a the wife or baiji uh, entertainer of course they're they're um sazindars their accompanists are men so they're leading a group of men and same thing when they become older also they're leading a group of male male instrumentalists and only the um the genre that they're singing is different and it's also the purpose is different it's not for um you know sexual attraction it's uh it's for social commentary uh i wouldn't say it's really spiritual uh but kind of you know um and they get more respect that way and there are even um i found some young women kavalas and i don't know why that is so you know how that you know who decided that somebody's going to be a kava a young woman is going to be a kavala um so that's that and um yeah so um what else would you like to discuss or oh, your your I, I i i will share with you with the my audience some of your videos just give me one second oh okay <laughs> thank you Thank you. 
was no picture. Uh, this was a melodious rendition, actually. Allah boy was hearing what you played. And I think there was no video. My video is there. Oh, okay. I didn't see it. It I didn't show here. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, it was a melodious uh, rendition, actually. Allah boy, I'm listening. Pure guy, you you playing. It's it's okay. pranam to my pranam to you my. Ah no 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 no. Thank you. Idea. It's very kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> my another question actually after you reached in the US, uh, you started performing over there. You share with uh, your audience over there, American musicians. You have mm -hmm. worked with the Paul Paul Kebler and a lot of musicians actually. And I I do remember actually we yeah. have played it together. Yeah. Uh, since you reached back in us what was the response uh, with american musicians while yeah. you play um well again there's that's been over many years you know of going coming and going so i sort of um returned the first time in the mid 80s and that time there was and to new mexico my home state which is quite rural and um you know again this is The mid 80s is before internet so internet really changed a lot <clears throat> so there was very little awareness um yeah. you know only people could if they had heard of it and still you find that um it's just ravi shankar um they will that's all pandit ravi shankar not not the guru ravi shankar sri not sri sri <laughs> ravi shankar but yeah. pandit ravi shankar um yeah. and um Uh, first it was like um you know people are fascinated by this exotic instrument and sound um and then over the decades now um more and more people are aware they know more about indian music so there are a lot more critical listeners there's still quite a few i i mean actually the part of the country that i mainly live in in uh texas there is uh you know a little bit less awareness uh for, for, you know like if you're on either coast in california or in new york new jersey massachusetts like that there's a lot more awareness and a lot of people who play and teach indian music here it's a lot less um austin is one center um <clears throat> dallas is they're not so interested in classical music so um I have so I developed while I was uh when I finished my PhD um when I was in Austin <clears throat> I decided that I want to uh actually spend a lot more time with music than I had when I was doing a PhD the music practice suffered because I had to study a lot and um uh so I decided after that that I, music really has to take more of um for uh a forefront part in my life and um i was thinking how i i always liked jazz and i liked saxophone um and i was uh inspired by well uh ali akbar khan sab in the 70s uh worked a bit with a jazz saxophonist called john handy and there were a couple of um recordings of that then uh shakti is a great experimental um project and um there's a little bit lesser known there's um Jan Garbarek is a Norwegian um jazz sax player who's interested in world music and interested in South Asian music and there was um a recording that came out in 1990 called Ragas and Sagas Saga is the um Norwegian uh folk form which is kind of like an epic uh tale saga you know when you use the word saga it means a long story right of someone's life or whatever so the sagas are sung in norway and um he just used that play on words and he uh played with a uh, a group of musicians that included sarangi tabla and vocal um and <clears throat> it was um I think they may have been from Pakistan. I was not familiar with those musicians. They um and 
he did mix it down where they're less audible. The, the saxophone is way up in the front of the recording, but still, I found it very beautiful and I listened to it a lot. And so I got this idea that I want to put together an ensemble um, with saxophone. And um, so I experimented. So I so the idea of Sangeet Millennium Ensemble uh, came about in the mid 2000s. And the first uh, I started first working with people it was before I met Paul, I had met Paul, but very briefly, um, I played in a um, one of his world music classes at a school, but we weren't we didn't stay in touch. So I worked with another few um, sax players first, um, starting in 2006, and um, actually even have some recordings with them. And one was um, in the it was like a top 10 in Texas nominated uh, album called Shimmering, with uh, Alex Koch was the sax player at that time. He's an eminent sax player also in Austin, um, who spent a lot of his career in Europe. And um, Shubrato Bhattacharya, uh, tabla player, was in it. Um, Nagavali, who's a vocalist in uh, based in Austin, was in it. And then uh, Paul and I started playing in 2008. So I just, um, I my concept, it's not, it's, it's become more refined over the years, but at first it was just to take certain um, bandish, you know, classical um, or kind of maybe lighter classical um, compositions and just have have the other musicians learn them and improvise. You know, it's just like you do Indian music, um, Hindustani music, that you just play the composition and then you improvise. So it's kind of like a jugal bandi because they're other musicians involved. You see how we were f trading phrases and that's how jazz is played too. So um, at a very basic level, it would work. The only thing is to get it contained um, to where it doesn't just go on and on, you know, and there's, you know, some kind of statement made with the music. So we began to work to refine our jams more um, and now we have a repertoire and uh he also um paul paul is a person i've worked with consistently since and 2000 I have several, several years back i also have a, a wonderful on living your show yeah right you. i think la uh, let me uh, let me uh switch on that video for my uh, viewers i have a collection of the video with me i kept it with me with your permissions uh sure. hope, uh, yeah <laughs> Oh yeah, that was great. And then when Polly came and
<laughs> you should play the one with the rest of the band with uh paul yeah play, yeah we, play a little bit had, of that uh, with um yeah yeah we had that that day exactly we had a concert together that but uh the last time when i visited over there we, we already done a jugalpandi and recorded yeah. the, no no the what i'm saying is what i'm saying is you could play a, a little bit of the the pieces that we played with paul with the fusion ensemble this was in in that concert you have that, you have that, that have, yeah, sure. yeah i'm going through the youtube and uh, getting you it is a wonderful uh, experience uh, it was with you Uh, yeah, and, we uh, had a great time. We really did. Uh, yeah. yeah, and anyway, actually, you are you are most senior in my new new world of music. I was uh, uh, learning or getting a lot of ideas from you that you have. Really? A, oh, that's so kind. Out. That is. That's I'm, very I'm, kind. I'm learning from everyone. I'm still. Well, I'm learning. <laughs> that's what, so this is this is something that Girja Devi ji. uh the, you know one many things you, you you know stay with you for your whole life from that you get for, from the gurus you forget many things but many things stay with you so she said ki sangeet mein hum log hamesha bachche we're always children when it comes to sangeet where it means we're always yeah. learning and you know she said that they look at me um at that time now you know when she was young when she was 76 she said look at me i'm 76 and kishan bhaiya kishan maharaj was he was still alive he was in his 80s or uh bismillah sab uh, bismillah khan sab who was almost 90 hum log sab bachche you know so we're always learning and that's how the music stays alive you know if yeah. you stop learning um if you think you're complete i mean besides i think even the biggest ustads uh certainly my ustad she says that um ashish da um ustad ashish khan sab my instrumental guru he says that you know he said only now he said i mean i can play maybe 2% of my what my father can you know yeah and, specific, uh, important thing that you have also got a wonderful lessons from uh, ashish da Ashish Khan, like today, yeah. today is my my her Krana is uh, one of the uh, other edge. Uh, so uh, we have to great to uh, pro, uh, get to your, that experience. Could okay. you share? Yes, could you share what was you about Ashish's class? Actually, you know, today is living legend. Ashish. Yeah. So it's um you know in that so what. Baba Alauddin Khan taught and then uh Baba Ali Akbar Khan sab taught and what Ashish da and um also his his late sister Baby D um Amina Pereira Srimati Amina Pereira um taught is that it's Sangeet is for everyone that's what their dadu their Baba Alauddin Khan the grandfather said that you know if you're going to keep it alive you have to make it you have to you can you have to make it available for everyone so even though you know they were ustad's family but they are really very different that you know many ustad families with respect no disrespect at all they want to keep it in the it's like property almost and um there are all these complex relationships who gets how much of the khazana of the musical repertoire according to your relationship to the family um but with my har gharana it was for everyone um and the classes you know i had both private and group classes um a lot of group classes in kolkata with you know 10 15 people even in kolkata there's always a crowd <laughs> and, and um you, you know you can get 50 people like that as you snap your fingers and you get 50 people <laughs> so um and it was multi generational so i see um you know so in uh early 2000s you know their uh kids who are now in their late 20s or so and you know becoming their rising performers very good perform that time they were 5 6 10 years old whatever so they would sit in the front and especially i remember one guy his name devanjan banerji who's now um you know eminent i mean he's he's junior but he's a very rising sarod player so he was 5 or 6 he would sit in the front of the class with um a little sarod and that time he he would the little kids are taught to just play diri diri first get your right hand going so he's just doing that and he's not really yet 
comprehending the material, you know, the matter that's being taught. So, but he's doing diri diri and he's watching uh, Guruji and imitating what Guruji is doing. So you have that and then you have, uh, you know, young adults and then you have even some elder people um, and everybody's learning together. And what Baba Ali Akbar Khan Sab would say that everybody, you know, it's, you take whatever you can from the class. So he, you, he just gives the material, the, the Ustad just gives them material, and then you absorb, everybody absorbs it in their own way. So that's what that class was like. Um, and then the private classes were very traditional. I mean, with Apaji too, Apaji is very traditional, and she um, demanded uh, a lot of formality, you know, pranam, uh, you know, you have to always wash your hands. So I, I thank her for now in the COVID times, you always have to wash your hands. So it's no problem because Apaji uh, Girza Devi Ji Siki Ki Hamid Hat Dona But with Ashish Da, it was, um, he's a bit short tempered. So he would yell at you a lot. Um, and it doesn't matter what age you, I mean, less so for small kids, I'd say, and more so for adults. And, um, Sometimes, and, and his grandfather was like that, sometimes say very insulting things, and then he would apologize and, you know, cook something for you. So that's, that's kind of that atmosphere. And um, the Sunday classes uh, in, in, his, uh, in his home in Kolkata in Goriahat Market, it's like right in the middle of the biggest market in South Calcutta. And they have an old um, family house there. It's, it's an apartment, it's quite old and the classes would be in one room there, and you have the classes, and then he says, lunch is compulsory. So there's always a lot of food around, um, and that's very much part of the talim. <laughs> uh, eating the food, sometimes cooking it together, or learning how to cook it. Um, and in, he often would come and stay with me in Austin, um, and a little bit in Dallas, more in Austin, um, and he would take over the kitchen. So. Um, and it, this thing that you read about the old masters, uh, if they're sleeping or doing something else and you're practicing, they can hear everything, you know, even if they're taking a nap and they'll, they'll just, uh, you know, you think they're asleep and you're, you know, you can do anything that you want. Hey, you know, like, <laughs> or cooking. Yeah. Um, and, uh, there was, a. Story I was going to tell right now I can't remember, but I it'll come back to me. Um, a story it's, about it's okay. I think uh, our listeners are uh, continuously waiting that waiting for. We should story. play. Yeah, we've you know, been we talking a lot. We should play okay. now. Yeah. Okay. They were yeah. listening the records or albums of ours only, yeah. Yeah. but uh, and uh, we will go for the play together, my dear friends. Just sure, to hear sure. rag vibhus. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and one more thing, Ashishda would say that. Ragas are like people. They <laughs> each one has a name and a personality. So yeah, definitely every raga yeah. has personality. Yeah. Vibhas is a morning raga. She yeah. she's basic morning over there. <laughs> so it's morning here. Yeah, we were going to play Yemen, but we changed uh, just now this morning uh, before we um, logged on. Uh, Polly was saying that's his guru's birthday and uh, his guruji. Uh, Pandit Vishwam Mohan Bhatt taught yeah. them Vibhas yesterday, right? Um, yeah, yeah, you, no, in the morning. Our, our, you're our, our, you're our this morning. morning, my yesterday, yeah. Um, so I said, well, let's play that because it's my morning. I feel yeah. more <laughs> to play a morning rag than Yam Yaman, you know, it has to be later in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>
lot of beautiful emotions in this rag the bus hope my dear friends you hope you enjoyed well uh, this is uh, unplanned unplugged <laughs> music <laughs> we never prepared anything like that we just planned only right just right now and we plan playing that's all uh, that is that is the beauty of uh, spontaneous music improvised to us of music indian classical music that is the beauty it is unplugged unplanned it it yeah. is a spontaneous it is un, it's, it can face uncertainty that's the beauty yeah. beauty of indian classical music yeah, you take risks you take risks and also you um you ride on the wave of the other person's energy i mean you ride on your own but i yeah. what i like about um this kind of jugal bandi is that you <laughs> you ride on the other person's wave as well you know you kind of carry you uh, yeah. it, it's also kind of um uh, i would tell kids when i'm t- it's like a volley it's like playing volleyball yeah. you know you <laughs> yeah you're taking the so ball good. it's like you know like uh um krishna <laughs> playing <laughs> with the ball right yeah, yeah and <laughs> just throwing it back and forth uh, like that okay uh anyway i'm going for some other subject is today is uh, we are going for going through the very pandemic situations covid yes. pandemic situation is all over the world actually and um, uh, amidi also uh, uh, we know we all know that america also going through the very badly hit the, by this covid uh, what is yes. the situation over there how is the situation well yes. you know um unfortunately are we don't have a leadership a, a unified leadership to um deal with this so un- you know we have the uh dubious very sad distinction of being of having the most the highest rate of infection in the world which is really shameful um we have given, we have, you know, we, have leaders, we have leadership it is very dangerous and pandemic <laughs> yeah yeah but i i don't really call it leadership you know so so there are a lot of conflicting messages as many of you who are following the news have heard um and um so people get confused and there are a lot of people who are denying the danger um and uh refuse to take proper precautions like wearing masks and um you know reacting in very selfish <clears throat> and um well i was stu- stupid i didn't want to use that word but <laughs> you know <laughs> very dangerous ways um because wearing a mask is to protect someone else you know and it's not it's not um uh what can i say an intrusion of someone's freedom it's a precaution i mean why do we have for example why do we have traffic laws to protect others and to protect ourselves while we are driving right and wearing a simple piece of cloth over your nose and mouth um i i get it um uh, and the people who are wearing it for hours and hours are the healthcare workers the people on the front lines who are subjecting themselves to the most risk and they are doing that faithfully and someone who um makes a scene um about having to wear a mask when they are um you know at the market at the grocery store shopping for 45 minutes because they think it's um interfering with their freedom is being very selfish and irresponsible so um i want to say that so that so there's there's not enough cooperation among the citizens but part of it is because at the leadership level you know those who look to that level for um for guidance are being are getting confusing messages so it's uh it's really sad and the, um i just the, want the, to uh world, i mean we are sorry i don't what? think the world is controlled by covid but the world is controlling by right wing leaders is mostly there are the yeah. covid i feel yeah um and one just has to be um mindful and um considerate of others yeah um you know you just wash your hands um also i i have to say though i have to admit that um someone like myself is very privileged i have enough water i have a big house i live in a neighborhood that's not very crowded so i can go for a walk 
um, with my dog and enjoy it and not have to wear a mask until, you know, just at times, sometimes you get to a place where there are people around. But I'm, you know, I'm feeling people, if someone's living in a slum um, and there's not enough water, how are they going to wash their hands, you know? Or, and how are they going to keep the distance from other people? Um, so that's the problem in India. And that's also the problem with, um, you know, the, you, I don't know if you saw it during your travels in the U.S., you know, there is a lot of poverty in the U.S. It's very different than in India. We don't have a billion people, more than a billion people. Um, we have a lot of infrastructure. There is... Um, a lot of poverty, particularly in urban areas where people are living close together, the resources are limited, you know, maybe the maybe there's running water, but it's not very good. Um, the uh, electricity is not very good, things like that. So um, the other thing that is exposing this COVID in this part of the world, I think everywhere in the world, it's exposing um, the immense disparity between the haves and have nots. Um, so in this country, it's, um, you know, poor people of color uh, are getting, I mean, it, it's numbers, it's now proven. I'm not just saying this because of my beliefs, but the um, Hispanic and African American community are getting COVID um, at a rate that's much, much higher. I don't remember how many times, you know, multiple times higher than, um, you know, middle class white people. The problem is actually most of uh, the, um, during India, I'm talking about our, uh, our middle class is least bothering about. Yeah, yeah, are, they're very uh, callous. Yeah. Uh, we are very careless and the conservative society is always like that traditional society. Yeah. yeah. Our 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 uh, um, uh, low class people means a very low level classes people are yeah, yeah. still walking on the road to reach the places thousand and thousand people walking 200 500 kilometer. I know, our, I know. I read about it. it. It's yeah. very tragic situations actually, no. I know. Uh, I know. Uh, so government least bothering the government yeah. only bothering that how to discriminate the people, how yeah. to uh, uh, split the people actually to control Well, here them it like is, you know, Polly, it's like that here too, just in a more sophisticated way, but yeah. not even very sophisticated anymore. But it's very much about the, you know, this whole thing about wearing a mask. And that was, um, you know, again, at the top level, at the top government level, it was that, you know, the messages were confusing about it. Um, so it, again, even that that little piece of cloth, which is not even as big as a handkerchief, um, is causing these deep divisions and fighting and everything. And it's also exposed, you know, the um, racial inequality. Um, so there's a lot. Now, to get on the positive side, there is a lot. It's also exposing um, a lot of generosity. You know, there are plenty of uh, private citizens um, who care deeply and are doing a lot of work in India. I know in India there are, you know, a lot of movements um, of, you know, people like yourself, middle class people, mainstream people who are get, taking food to um, poor people, their uh, medicine, they're raising money and stuff like that here also. So that's, you know, a very good side of humanity is being exposed and a lot of creativity because you, you and I as performing artists, um, suddenly, uh, yes, there are a lot of people who lost their jobs, but these, you know, we as um, self-employed freelance people are hit the hardest because, um, you know, we can't, our, our bread and butter is performing publicly you know, often indoors, usually indoors, right? And we can't do that suddenly. Our, um, our concerts, our performances, our gigs are um, canceled because of this. And um, so there are lots of creative ways like what you're doing. Um, you're reaching out to a global audience and yeah. bringing different mu musicians, your friends from around the world um, yeah. to uh, make music. And um, there are lots of, uh, I see there's a lot going on um, that's inspired by 
um, these um, restrictions. So, you know, people are just getting creative about... I know the um, most, most of the musicians in India, uh, they opened their eyes to in, in last two centuries. Myself, uh -huh. <laughs> I opened my eyes to the coming centuries. That's the only difference, actually. <laughs> so yeah. the most very conservative, actually. They are most, uh, more, uh, the society is very inactive. Opposition is very inactive. It, it, it's, um, you know, the, the Indian listeners, there, there is no proper listeners, actually. Government de 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 deliberately splitting the proper listeners and uh, art. They are now discouraging artists. They are uh, threatening the artists, writers, mm -hmm. and everyone. They are getting uh, fewer to how to, they couldn't come out. They couldn't come out. You know the, mm -hmm. how many writers and uh, how many activists in jail right now. This pandemic lockdown situations, actually, between no one knows it actually. Underneath, there are a lot of things happening that getting arrested, a lot of musicians, a lot of writers, a lot of activists. The mm -hmm. world didn't discuss it, actually. Yeah. Yeah. India is going to become very dangerous situations. Yeah. It's coming, coming, well, coming years, actually. A lot of protesters, activists, um, I wouldn't, well, not specifically artists, but people who um, are, you know, participating in protests. And the protests are, you know, you probably know, racially motivated um, <clears throat> because of, uh, again, it's exposed during the pandemic, it has exposed racial inequalities and uh, often police brutality, racism, racially motivated uh, police brutality. Um, so, a lot of the protesters are getting put in jail um, here. Yeah, the, well. there is, so it's uh, it's pretty. It's also pretty dangerous because the, we um, matter, matter of the judiciary also is very dangerous. Actually, the judiciary is yeah. un, uh, it's lost control. The judiciary is controlled by I think uh, right wing leaders only. All most of the judge, judgment is belongs to uh, support them only. You know. What uh, what leaders says the judges will uh, uh, listen. Uh, more, 29 uh, judgment are supporting RSS and uh, right wing leaders only. The you you uh, I myself I will tell you I have a lost a hope. Even I have a lost a hope in media. I including uh, uh, judiciary. So when I talk like this, there are a lot of uh, right wing people who told me you get away from my country. So it is mm -hmm. very extreme comedy that actually it was not their country because while freedom fighting was happening, actually they were they were victim they were cheating <laughs> to the uh, the people of British actually. So mm -hmm. the problem is there is no country for anyone. There is only one world. The yeah, boundary yeah. belongs to your heart. Well, yeah. Whenever uh -huh. you make boundaries, yeah. 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 whenever you make a boundary to your heart. There mm -hmm. you will in one your your country. This is a uh, pandemic situation. Scared yeah. of that, because when you talk, this is my country. That is extremely comedy, extremely yeah. funny, extremely scary, because there is no country for you. Mm -hmm. There is no country for anyone. You have a, there is only one planet for you. Uh -huh. Yeah, and we have to take care of that planet too. So that's all. We have to take care of the environment. We have to take care of our, our, our nature. We have to take care of all. We have to take care of our Africa. We are coming from Africa. Yeah. Our life has happened in Africa. We all are coming from one mother. Yes. Uh, so whatever we play, whether it's Hindustani or Carnatic or jazz or blues, everything mm. based in sound and silence. Silence is the beautiful platform. Uh -huh. That platform only we invented sound from there. Without uh -huh. platform, we, our train couldn't reach anywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, really. <laughs> this is what is truth for me. Mm -hmm. anyway, any, anyway, Amidi, uh, this was a wonderful conversation with you. Yeah, and this, thank I'm, you. I'm honored that uh, you played with me, and Got I'm it. honored uh, honored that uh, uh, you are part of my show. I'm. My dear listeners, hope you enjoyed this session. And I'm also the, honored and very happy. It's always a pleasure to, um, you know, interact with you, Polly. I look forward to the time when we can meet in person and make music definitely. in the same physical space. 
but for now the virtuals we're grateful to have this virtual space i'm grateful for you to provide this beautiful virtual space and thank you all for listening to so much talk um <laughs> and um this, this yeah i think it's, really, two, it's time this is for, almost two hours finished <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it's time for your dinner now so <laughs> this, is matter, this is not this is not matter of dinner it is matter i know i know part of our feast No, so again, uh, uh, Baba Ali Akbar Khan said, "Music is our food." You know. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. we can't survive. <laughs> we can't survive without it. You know. So, okay. <laughs> anyway, so happy you are with us. A wonderful, my dear listeners, my dear, yeah. my dear friends. Uh, the show is going to end up about wind up the show. You will listen wonderful composition of her. I will put uh, switch on the video. Uh, that is the last session of this show. Thank you, Didi. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank Namaskar. you. Wonderful. Love you all. Namaste. Yeah. Bye. All the best. Peace. Bye. Same. You too. You take care. Chevsky and I'm here to invite you to be part of an extraordinary project with Sangeet Millennium my initiative to tour modern India